Welcome to the channel, guys. Welcome to this live stream. Um, today, we're going to be doing a live, screen, uh, live stream between Mitch Brisker and myself. Let's get him in here. And um, there we go. Hello, Mitch. Hey, Mark. Um, we're going to be uh, covering the next in our series, uh, Making a Film uh, with uh, Mark and Mitch. Or Mark and Mitch Make a Scientology Film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's close enough. And um, if you um, there, we I was just up on a uh, fundraising stream that we were doing over on um, the Blown for Good channel and the um, well, they're still live. So I don't know if they jam if they're running into us or if they actually are in here. I hope you guys are in here. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works if you're doing two live streams on your channel at the same time. So um, hopefully they are they're in here. I'm going to pull up the comments here. Uh, people are watching. So, uh, hey, Mitch and Mark. Okay, good. So uh, hopefully it, it all worked out okay. Um, if you are just coming over from that stream, um, I'm Mark Headley. Uh, this is Mitch Brisker. We both worked at Golden Era Productions. Um, I worked there from 1990 to 2005. And Mitch Brisker, what were the years you worked there, Mitch? Uh, 90, same year you started, to uh, 20, almost 2020. Although a few of those years I was at Scientology Media Productions. Wow. So he, I was there 15 years. He was there, was that, that 30, that's 30 plus years, I'm going to say. Not 30 plus. It was a little under 30. Please, Mark, don't hang that Okay. On it just seems like I'm not the, I mean, I grew up in a cold. I'm not the best at math. I think yeah, well, I got. I, <laughs> I went to art school, so I'm not great at math either. <laughs> So, so let's say 20 years yeah. then. Uh, 28. Let's just call it 28. 28 years. Yeah, with a couple at, uh, at Scientology Media Production. Nice. Yeah, okay. I mean, I was the guy who, like, you know, stay too late at the party, okay? Okay. Like, are you going to go now? I'm yeah. Like, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Um, so in our last, in our first video, we covered uh, the training routine film number eight, TR8, which right. was start change and stop and today we're going to cover tr7 right the upper induct trs and induct is indoctrination and right. when you i mean when you first get into scientology one of the first things you do is these training routines to teach you how to uh, be able to communicate right and um and there is a, a tr a, a series of trs in Scientology called the Upper Indoc TRs. You want to say anything more about that, Mitch? Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, they, they basically are, uh, they're really objective processes. I mean, they're training drills that teach you, yeah, here's what I have to say. These yeah. drills are specifically designed to get you to comply with another person's orders. And that other person is a proxy for L. Ron Hubbard and the Church of Scientology. So without you knowing it, you are being taught to say, yes, sir, how high? How many times do you want me to jump and how high? And that really? Completely that, what they're about. They're about nothing else. Yeah, they're about control. Yeah. And, they, and in Scientology, um, one of the things that L. Ron Hubbard teaches is that in order to control others, you need to be able to be willing to be controlled yourself. Right. And if and you're that not, is, yeah, if you're not willing to be controlled, that is considered a spiritual deficit. You, you are spiritually damaged. Yeah. That's kind of crazy if you think about it. Really nuts. Yeah. And Mark and I, we were at the forefront <laughs> yeah. training people how to do this. Yes. And, and this film, um, Upper End Doc TRs is a very unique film in many aspects. Most of the films that were shot either by um, Mitch or even before Mitch, um, it didn't have um, Sea Org members from the Imp base as the main stars of the film. They had, um, they even in the film that they shot right before this film, it was two Scientology actors. That, um, that were the main parts of the film. And in this film, there was a gentleman by the name of Al Mace, and um, he was in the technical areas of Golden Era Productions. Like he worked as a supervisor or he worked in the qualifications division delivering counseling. And then in the other gentleman that was in this was um, in the kind of financial um, departments of Scientology, and his name was Lyman Spurlock. And um, they were the two main characters of this film. 
And Lyman, he went. Uh, he worked with Hubbard, did he not? I think he went all the way back. Mm. Okay, fine. We'll ask. Uh, we need to our, ask somebody who was of, around when Hubbard was around. <laughs> yeah. Mark, Mark, and I are. We're the historians of our time. That's like it. Yeah, that's prehistoric in Scientology yeah. terms. Yeah. If you were around when LRH was around, L. Ron Hubbard, that is. Yeah, but I think I think Lyman, he was definitely an old timer. And I, I just there's one little bit of color I want to add about this film. Yeah. Uh, this was during the early days when we were working on the films in the 90, early 90s when we were using staff, uh, gold-based staff members. And um, I have to say, this is probably the only film where the leads, the film that I did with Mark, where the leads were played by staff. And these two guys actually did a really good job. Just a little shout out to them. Lyman's passed on. I don't know where Al is. But they actually did an amazing job in, in these parts. Probably because they were about control, right? Well, I mean, to be honest, they were both Sea Org members. Right. Um, I actually had the unique um, position to know both of them pretty well. Al Mace was in the, um, he started out in that sort of technical areas in Golden Era. And then he kind of transitioned over to the audio areas in Golden Era Productions. And when I was the audio um, quality control in the manufacturing division, um, when I got promoted, and oddly enough, I think it was when I went to the cine, when I went over to the cinematography division, I was replaced on my post by Al Mace to be really? the audio QC. Wow. Yeah, that's he's the one who took over my job so that I could go work in the um, cinematography right. area. Right. And then Lyman was uh, roommates. Lyman and his wife Carol were roommates wow. with Claire and I because Lyman eventually was sort of kind of back and forth between RTC and um and cmo int in the finance kind of um area and um so his uh so Mitt, uh lyman and carol and claire and myself and another couple all shared a house down uh, right right next to the property right next to the base and i have to say lyman's wife carol uh when i was up there reviewing all the films she was the closest thing that gold had to like an in-house movie star she was like a tech film it girl. Do you remember that, Mark? She was like that's true. She she'd was been in, in all these films. Yeah, she had been in almost all the films, and that does kind of uh, lead me to believe that Lyman was probably around when L. Ron Hubbard was around because Carol was because she was in some of the films that even L. Ron Hubbard had shot. Oh, right, right. So right. it's very. Well, I, I, I remember when I met her, she, not having anything to do with films. Yeah, I think she. I think she was working in editing when I first got up there. I was a little starstruck because I'd seen her in all, in all these tech films. I'm like, wow, you're that person. So. Yeah, there are a few people at the Imp base that were in many, many films, especially um, Dan Kuhn and a guy by the name of Bob Waldman, who was known as Waldo. Him and Dan Kuhn were in this film that L. Ron Hubbard shot that was uh, TR4. Yeah, the professional TRs course. Yeah, would so. be the long title. Yeah, and that film was, I think, the longest film to live in theater, in Scientology theaters, without yeah. being redone right. because it was done by L. Ron Hubbard, and it was sort of the the top-level standard for how you would do certain um, training routines in Scientology because right. L. Ron Hubbard had approved them the way he shot them. Well, yeah, he had directed these people. Like, he directed Dan Kuhn to do these TRs, so everybody thought... I used to have people said, oh, you did the tech films. And I would say, yes, everyone but TR4, because it was a, an agreed upon thing. We would never do this film. This film was sacred. It had been kissed by the lips of Jesus. I mean, literally, it was on that kind of level. Yeah. Of, of, and then, as it eventually, there was nothing in the film. Maybe one or two people. Everybody else were SPs. Yeah. They all left. Two of all... one. It wasn't yeah. like there was 20 people in the film and five of them SPs. No. It was like there was 20 people in the film and 19 and a half of them were SPs. Like yeah. some of them were still SPs. They just hadn't been declared SPs yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah, but I think the only one that survived was like Bob Waldman. Yeah, that's what I was saying. And yeah, even he was a... in the grounds department as yeah. the as yeah. the lawn mowing I yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, but I think, uh, I mean, we'll get to it when we get to it. But as it turned out, uh, we did remake that film after Mark left. We had to remake it because there were so many SPs in it. And then I was given the inside dope 
on the original film by uh, Miscavige, which is that Hubbard actually hated the film. No. Yeah, he hated it. And I saw it in writing. He he thought their TRs were horrible. But yet they were the standard for 40 yeah, years. <laughs> because they were, he made the film because he pulled a bunch of uh, tapes of auditors up to wherever he was, La Quinta. And he looked at those. They were from basically from the Los Angeles org. And the their auditing procedure was so horrific. He ordered them. One of them was Dan Coon. He ordered them up to gold. And a bunch of them joined the Sea Org. They made the film. He hated the film. But he had to get something out there. Something was better than nothing. But boy, what a... When a, a revelation when I was told, oh, yeah, no, that was not the film he wanted. He hated wow. the film. You're going to make the film he wanted. But 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 up until Dave wanted it to be redone, was, see, and this is how Dave kind of manipulates right, and games the system, right, right. is something is written by L. Ron Hubbard until David Miscavige doesn't want it to be, and then he can f dig up the supporting evidence that uh, L. Ron Hubbard didn't like this, and now every and then he can let that be known, and then the film can be redone. Well, he didn't let anybody know. He doesn't. He didn't let people know that he didn't like it. Yeah. He, ha he has so much credibility inside the bubble that if he redoes, he, he if the film is if he redoes it and has and releases it, people just go with it. They're like, oh, well, must have been wanted yeah, that way. Yeah, they, he doesn't even have to say it. Wow. So, but yeah, there was uh, there's more on that. And when we get to that film, I'll tell you because it's okay. So Mark, you can verify this. When we were done with the film, yeah, all of the the valuable documents would be the script and the script girl notes and all the camera logs and, and all this stuff. And they'd put it in a steamer trunk. Remember? Yes. These, these trunks, right? Yeah. Like a sea org trunk that you, like a trunk yeah. that you would put on um, the Titanic when you're going uh, across right. the ocean. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steamer. They call them steamer trunks, right? Yes. And they'd put everything in there and they'd put a big label on it, you know, the name of the film and the date. And then they'd put them in some super secret archive somewhere and usually yeah. every film would fill up average a half to a full steamer trunk mm -hmm. but this film we're talking about the professional trs film it filled two steamer trunks right <laughs> yes. there was so much stuff going on it took them a year to fill to, to, to complete the film yeah H hubbard shut the thing down in the middle of it and went off for nine months and he developed this thing called clay table auditing where you played with clay and made a bunch of like Gumby characters. And somehow this was a spiritual advancement. Yes. And then, and then he filled filmed that he put that all in the film. So, but I went through both of these steamer trunks and in those steamer trunks, there was hours and hours and hours of tapes of uh, the, the messengers recorded him directing the film. And I listened to all of those tapes and boy, man, he was screaming and yelling and, uh, cajoling them into doing TRs right. Uh, they never, I mean, like he would do line readings for them. No, say it exactly like this. And wow, the film, it was a disaster. I mean, not to mention, see, we're actually now doing that film. We need to get back to the film we're doing. I know, right? That's what we'll, I was going to say. We'll, yeah. But you know, we do need, we did um, forget to do this last time. And I want to make sure we don't. You guys, if you're watching on my channel, Bone for Good, Exposing Scientology, head over to Mitch's channel um, at Scientology, the big lie and like, and subscribe to the video on his channel or just switch over to his channel and open it up and watch it over there. Um, he needs to get, um, we're trying to get his channel going and um, that's why we're doing this content and uh, we want to let people know about it. He's also got an Indiegogo. Um, he's trying to write a book. Um, it's done. It's basically done. Okay, good. So he's yeah. trying to release a book. Yeah. And he needs yeah. a little bit of uh, extra support and resources in order to do that. So if you if you want to uh, support that, you can go over to Indiegogo, and it's uh, Scientology: The Big Lie. And um, yeah, that's. Uh, do we have anything else we need to show? There's also no. I I put a link to Mitch has got to buy a coffee. That is a li that link is in the description. So yeah, if you want to, you could buy me a coffee. And if you happen to be in Studio City where I live, come by. I'll buy you a real coffee. Nice. Right. Awesome. Okay. I wanted to, I wanted to show that because we, um, Thanks, we Mark. did forget to do that in the oh, last yeah, and, video. And since you're mentioning the last video, a couple of corrections. Yeah. Um, uh, one person wrote in, uh, <laughs> Judy Norton Taylor. Yes. Was, was, <laughs> did I say little house on the prairie or no, did I, you say little house I, on the prairie? 
That okay. was on me. It was the Waltons, Waltons that she was. This was the show that Judy Norton was on. Right. Um, so the girl from Little House in a Prairie that you all love and you grew up with, right. she is not in Scientology. Yeah. But if you grew up with and watched the Waltons, that girl is. So right. I'm sorry to break it to the yeah. Walton people. When you were happy, it was the Little House in the Prairie girl. It's yeah. actually the Walton girl. Um, Ooh, that's out of the way. Was there anything else we messed up besides that? No, 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 that's the I only think, thing I really uh, saw. Yeah, I mean, the only thing worth mentioning. All okay, other, good. Sorry other, about uh, that, uh, Laura Ingalls or whatever her real, her name is. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so the film we're covering today is the title is TR8. I mean, um, TR7, um, Upper Indoc TRs. The cast was Al Mace and Lyman Spurlock, and then there was a few other extras in there here and there, but they were they're not not nothing really to mention, and that I even remember that they no, did. No, no, the other actors. Are you, yeah, like there were other people, like oh, yeah. extras in there, and like they go. There's like a cafe scene, and there's like a yeah, right. There's a few other it's, scenes, but the people are. I don't even remember who was in those. They're well, so Rick, just I, okay. The supervisor was a professional actor named Rick Rossi. Yes, remember? we used him for everything back yeah. then. Yeah, he was like he was like our Jason Begay of the nineties, yeah. <laughs> where he was just yeah. like in everything we yeah. could throw him in, and that was. Right. There was a reason for that because if you had an actor that was in a film that Dave liked or Dave approved, then it was sort of that actor then had a foot in the door and right. he could be in, in – and if he was a certain post in an organization, we, we it, it seemed like there was some sort of convention that was go, was going for that that guy could be the ED or he could be the qualification yeah. secretary yeah, in yeah, multiple yeah, yeah. films. Yeah, like like the the films how the E meter no not how, uh, uh, E meter reads film the film that taught you to understand the different motions of the needle, uh, and another one called. PC indicators, which another one we're going to get to. These are all really fun films. Yeah. This is this is about the, the the sort of dramatics that a person goes through. You know, they're crying, they're whatever, they're laughing, their eyes are dull. Then it tells the auditor to spot and recognize all these things. And those two films, in particular, they had a guy at the beginning playing a senior CS, which would be the highest. Uh, the highest technical person in Scientology. Case supervisor. Yeah, it's the case person who says what your next auditing procedure and action should be in Scientology. Yeah, the, and he, he evaluates. Your, he's, a, he's the guy. The, he's the wizard behind the curtain. And who did we have play that? that we had we, a guy. Well, that's why I mentioned it, Mark. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for keeping me on track. Yeah. Um, a guy named John Rixie Moore, who was a terrific actor. Yeah, uh, he, he was an actor and a playwright and a theater director. But most interestingly, he was a member of the first Green B Beret detail when it was formed. And he was a part of Operation Phoenix, which was a covert op, a real thing. He wrote a book about it. Covert, they ran covert ops. through. They went through Cambodia into North Vietnam and they assassinated um, uh, a military and, and, and political uh leaders and they had to bring their heads back in a bag for compliance and eight pounds eight no 16 pounds average 16 pounds yeah, average <laughs> but you remember he talked about that. i remember it was like the <laughs> most bizarre thing that somebody would know how much yeah. a head weighs and you're just yeah. like what like yeah, this guy know how much a head weighs if you put it in a bag <laughs> yeah it was it was you guys have no idea how much how, how heavy a head is after you've carried it in the jungle for three days and this guy, he was a great guy. He was a gentleman warrior. You'd never know that he w had done any of these things. And he was the senior CS in those films. People thought he was like the real deal. The, you know, if they saw him on the street, they'd be asking him questions about auditing. Yeah, and and also some of these people that like we had another guy that we used. Well, there was a bunch of them. There was a there was a cast of Usual Suspects. There was. Um, Robert F. Lyons, otherwise known as Bobby Lyons. Yeah, Bobby. We had um, Michael um, Roberts, Michael D. Roberts. Oh, which, yeah. Um, yeah. He was usually an executive, and uh, he yeah, was. And a he bunch did of a whole, hold on, Bobby, Bobby. You look up his resume. You look him up on IMDb. He did a lot of stuff, a lot of TV. Michael Roberts was had a featured part in Rain Man. He did a lot. Remember yeah. that he was. Featured. He was also in Ice Pirates. Ice Pirates. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, these guys were. We, uh, Jeffrey Lewis was another one. If we could get him, and if if the part well, worked, we'd get him. Yeah, we had him for two two pretty big parts, but that had 
only a few shoot days because he was really tough to get. Yeah. And Isaac and, Hayes, hey, we had Isaac Hayes. You, you were gone by then, I think. No, I was there when oh, we yeah. did the TR5 with Isaac oh. Hayes on the space platform. Oh, yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. That's, and he couldn't read there. any of L. Ron Hubbard's yeah, verbiage. Yeah, that was like, what am I thinking? <laughs> that was like 2000. Yes, it yeah, was there. It was, it was the first film that we shot in, in the, the castle. city castle. Yeah. yeah, it's the reason that I had them build it, so I could have a huge green screen and we could yes. do them like that was, giant uh, yeah. psych wall. I think it's um, the biggest one in Southern California. Yeah, I would tell people that when I'd give them the tour, whether that was the case or not. No, I had I a whole it, spiel. Yeah, there's a lot of things about the castle we used to say that were not true, <laughs> but the size of that psych, it's it's either the biggest in Southern California or it's one of the top three it, it's and it might have been the biggest at the time because no one had enough money or resources to just make a giant yeah. studio with that big of a psych wall in it that was permanent but, yeah they, um, but they don't really they're not quite as necessary anymore because tracking software and special effects have just really advanced totally yeah so anyway but this is now we're in film school Okay, yes. Let's go okay. So in this film, um, the studio or location that this film was shot at was this film was shot at Golden Era Productions and it was shot in the small studio at the international headquarters of Scientology called The yeah. Gym. And right. we talked about The Gym in the last video. So if right. you don't know why it's called The Gym, back to back to the uh, first video we did. Um, and then um, uh, key points uh, Sea Org members are the main cast in this new film. Um, and, um, what else, what else about this film is unique? How did the, um, because I wasn't on the crew. I think I may have been in one of those scenes where, um, they're in a cafe or in the, the in restaurant, the restaurant scene at the end, we had a girl who, uh, if you watched my, my response video, this is a real piece of arcade inside dope. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did a response video to me slamming Ron Miscavige Sr. That was really the only hate video that I ever did. I wasn't involved in all that stuff. I'm going to do an episode about my involvement with that stuff. Uh, but I, I spoke in there uh, about this Ron having hit on my girlfriend, which was true, but it's like, so what? And I made this big thing about it. You can watch my reaction video. It's on my channel. It's called, I was a Scientology flying monkey. And, okay. it's, it's, and I'm like holding myself accountable for having been involved in this video. But the girl who, well, they're never going to get to see her. But the girl who was, that I referred to uh, in that video, she was the girl in, the, in this film at the end in the cafe. Okay. Uh, yeah. And do you remember the gag? The whole gag was... Okay, so these drills, they're about intention. The idea that you can get something done. Yes. Like it's one thing to, there's one level of control where you pick a thing up, you know, and they do that, they yell at it. Yeah. You know, stand book up. It, book in a bottle. In this yeah. movie. Yeah, I'm yelling in this at movie. My, my mouth, stand up. <laughs> Sit down. You know, I'm going, thank you. You know, it's just, if you've heard about that stuff, this is the film yeah. they teach you how to yell at ashtrays, books, yeah, and bottles. Yeah, and how, and how to move people around and be controlled. <laughs> and the gag at the end was that they're trying to get some, one of the, the stars of the film is, uh, is well, with they're, they're, someone. They're, yeah, no, it's Al. It's Al. Yeah. And Al is with this cute girl who's who's just shows up at the cafe at the end, and she keeps saying, um, "Waitress." Yes. Um, waitress. Um, and she can't get the waitress. And then Al says, watch this. And he just looks at the waitress. And she like turns around. Like, yes, now and comes like, right over to yeah. the table. And this is, yeah. this, the reason this is key is because Scientologists 100% believe that they can control other objects and other people with their minds. Yeah. And so I think, this is I one of those. In a film, so. and, and almost always, if you look, if you look, there's a there's a Scientology magazine called Advance, and it is the magazine of the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles. And every time they put one of these magazines out, they have a section in the magazine called OT Phenomena, and it always seems to center around Scientologists getting a table at a restaurant or getting a parking space or getting out of a ticket. Those are the three things that most Scientologists use their powers to, to d achieve in Los Angeles, that is. Maybe that's yeah. just because it's a vehicle and outdoor yeah. eating yeah, no, sort of metropolis. Very, very automotive. I mean, 
Los Angeles is built around the car. I mean, we invented the drive-in. Right? I mean, it's just like LA is a car. You know, they sell more Porsches in in, in Los Angeles than they sell in all of Germany. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, but it's it's like a car place, and Scientologists can also control traffic jams. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think you mentioned that one, but traffic. Well, it's automobile traffic. automobile nonsense in general is yeah, what you need you to use your OT powers. Yeah. Mostly yeah. getting out of tickets or or not getting a ticket from a meter maid. That's where that Theta Potato story comes from. There's a lot of things like that where yeah. they, uh, and they it really... All, it all starts with the films. I mean, that's Yes. What, this is where they learn those SP yeah. powers is you know, in the One in thing the I, I want... I just remember, Mark, one thing I wanted to mention. Do you remember that we would get catchphrases out of the films? Like, like I duplicate you utterly. Yes. Like, like, okay, like these catchphrases, they, they're basically just lines from the film. And you'd hear people from all over the world saying these catchphrases. So as we go along, if we remember any of these catchphrases from these films, because some of them are pretty choice. And if there's any ex-Scientologists out there who saw any of these films and you remember quotes, catchphrases from any of the films, please let us know. Yeah, were there any in there? I know there's a sort of, it's also not very common for there to be a lot of comedic um aspects to these well, no, things but if it's from a film and you're actually quoting l ron hubbard you know like the thing you did when you were the messenger you played a messenger in how to set up a session of the e-meter and you in africa yeah. and you EM5. popped five yeah em5 and you popped in the room and went wrong room and slammed the door right yep and left. yep now that became a thing that is and if like, i did go into a room and i was the people i weren't in there i would often say oops wrong room and then yeah. i just closed the door just yeah. like i did in the film yeah but people like if you were expected somewhere and it was not some executive who was going to be pissed off at you you could walk you'd walk in you go oh wrong room and then you'd come back in and it yeah just, and everybody got the joke because it was yeah. from the film yeah so as long as we kept our humor in this one context of yeah it was l ron hubbard said it's funny he wrote it because it's funny yeah or we can we can make it funny too as opposed to uh you know, um, I had a different version of the end of that film. But didn't it, we get in trouble for that video too? Which one? My version? I don't know. No, I remember that there was sort of a gag that was done where like after a shot was over or something and then somebody smashed a car or smashed a a miniature and then we kind of yeah, joked I about it. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. And then Dave ended up seeing it and it was like, you wasted uh, money on film oh, and you I did... Can't. I, I remember, remember. I remember being in trouble, but I don't remember why. Yeah, I always. That's <laughs> the same thing. I remember. Oh, I remember that. And it'd be like, well, why did you get in trouble? I was like, I don't remember why I got in trouble, but I remember being in trouble. I remember that part. Yeah, it might have been that we cut some bloopers together. That's what I think. That yeah, was like an we, outtake reel, yeah, and it we, was sort of like you guys wasted film and wasted like time. processing and yeah. editing time to put together a blooper reel, like what's going on guys you're not you're not real your your yeah. your mind and heart are not really in the cause here yeah you're, right you're, you're, you're being screwing like off people and you're like cutting off. that's what it was it was like yeah. we were being hollywood we yeah. were being hollywood instead we of being sea org but then he would go to the ship and he'd cut blooper reels together. i know it was a very mixed message because he was yeah. allowed to do it but we yeah. weren't <laughs> you so, guys can't be funny i'm the only one who can be funny we're yeah, speaking exactly. of david Misavage when we say he yeah Sometimes. um are there any other i don't so i don't really remember well there's one thing you you reminded me of which i utterly forgotten and that was uh al mace the co-star yeah his role in tom cruise's training yes so for those of you do, who don't know tom cruise when he was first in scientology he was doing courses and getting counseling at the international headquarters of scientology because it wasn't trusted that he would go anywhere else because those people would most likely mess it up and then he'd leave Scientology. So David Miscavige wanted him to train and get his Scientology counseling, what in Scientology they refer to it as auditing. They wanted him to do all of that under Dave's direct supervision at the international base. So one of the ways and one of the courses that he was doing was he was doing these upper indoc, upper indoctrination. Um, he was doing the processes and he was also auditing them on somebody else. And so they figured, well, who better to get him 
to twin. Like when you when you do a course, uh, when you do a um, courses in Scientology, you're often given what's called a twin, and your twin is doing the course at the exact same pace as you are. And when you um, need to get what's called a checkout or somebody to kind of quiz you on the materials, you that you, the twin quizzes you, and then you quiz the twin, and you kind of go back and forth throughout the course. Well, who better to be Tom Cruise's twin on the course than the guy that's the actor in the film that's approved on how to do those things? Right, right. And so he, Al Mace and also... It was, it was like getting Tom Cruise as your pilot. That's right. But <laughs> Al Mace also was a really short guy. Yeah, he, yeah, so he, uh, he yeah. might have been shorter than Tom. So yeah, it, was a, it was a good way to make Tom feel like this is the best twin I'm going to get. And also... He doesn't have to look up to that guy. He can right. look down to that guy, and they're yeah. they're they're kind of on equal footing, and so that was his twin. And I, the only reason I even know this is because I was the guinea pig that Tom Cruise did his counseling on. And when I would go to the course room to get this counseling from Tom Cruise, it wasn't private at all. We were just sitting at a desk, and on the other side of the room was Kirsty Alley, and she had a twin that was a right. Sea Org member, and Nicole Kidman was in there, and she had a twin who was a Sea Org member, and Al Mace was there because he was right. Tom Cruise's twin. So, um, and yeah, it was kind of, um, it was kind of a baller move by Dave to just say, we're going to have Tom Cruise here and all these people are going to come up here and just be props, really, in this little thing that we're doing with Tom Cruise. Well, like well, well, Kirstie Alley didn't need to be there. Yeah, she was just there studying. So it didn't make it look like we were doing right. something special for Tom that we did this all oh, the time. I never knew that. Yes, Kirsty was even, there. I never even thought about like Nicole being in the course room because yeah, she, she was, was doing there. the PTSSP That's course. So crazy. Nicole was doing the PTS, which is potential trouble source slash SP course, suppressive right, person. Right, There's right. a course. That's one of the yeah. first courses you do in Scientology to learn that anybody that doesn't want you to be in Scientology, who is warning you about you just yeah. getting into Scientology, that those people are either potential trouble sources or their SPs. Most likely their SPs. Yeah, we did the course. We all do the course. All the SPs yes. that you see on YouTube. Yeah. Oh yeah. We oh yeah, we that's true. Do. Almost every SP that you see on YouTube has done this course. So we know yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um anyway, so yeah. yeah, so they sort of set up a mock course room for Tom Cruise. Oh, and the VIP that, course room. And that um, is what they essentially created at the Celebrity Center years later, is they do have a special course room for the A-list celebrities. And then right, everybody right. else, it, the riffraff and the the people that do commercials on TV and, um, and anybody else, whether they do anything or not, they go in the regular kind right. of um, the regular, uh, yeah. well, I don't know how you explain it, the, just the Josh, the riffraff course room. Yeah, the entourage. And, yeah, exactly. The the Tom Cruise's assistant is in that course room, and Tom Cruise is in the A list uh, room. I remember they had this sp space up there set up for Tom, but I didn't realize those other people were in it. Yeah, it, well, the the to be fair, the course room that we were in was just a conference room of the music studio, right? Um, where right. they recorded uh, music for L. Ron Hubbard for the films and for. We Stand Tall video, video, videos, whatever music needed to be recorded and mixed, it was done in the L. Ron Hubbard Music Studio, and it had a it had a sort of a conference, like a meeting room that was all motifed. Again, the whole this whole place is right. motifed up the, the up right. the A. So this one had it was the Knights of the Round Table. No, I don't motif. think so, Mark. I think what do you was, mean? I think it was Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> well, either way, there was suits of armor in there. Oh, there you know you. It because was, it was Knights of the Round Table because the tavern Yeah, we were Knights of the Round Table. You're right. That and was you knights. you actually gave me my knight nickname. Which was you, what? You what may did... not remember this. <laughs> I do not it remember. Was Sir Late a lot. Uh, Sir what? Late a lot? Late a lot. Oh yeah. late a lot. Oh yes, I do remember that. Yes. Oh Sir Late a lot. Well, yeah, to be I was fair. Late a lot. <laughs> it was usually Monday mornings. Right. Was because otherwise you were there. Yeah, right, exactly. But Monday morning, but the Monday morning start was always a little rocky oh, because yeah. Oh, yeah. Mitch but wasn't getting up drive. at no six a.m. Yeah. to get there. He's getting up at eight to get there by nine. It's a two-hour drive. You don't really know that. But okay. um, I don't know, but yes. <laughs> anyway, um, but yes, the um, 
that was so this this conference room had two knights uh suits of armor at the yep. opening of the door and then it just had these just giant wood and metal tables and chairs and yeah it, and was, it was it was the cleanest room in the world like it you, well it you, had people that were assigned because 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 this was l ron hubbard's music studio right there's a special group of people within the commodore's messenger organization and it's called hu the household unit and there must have been 10 different people that took care of right. mowing his lawns and wipe uh, setting um cleaning and vacuuming his house and these people also cleaned his studio and any of the ancillary spaces that were surrounding the studio yeah. so it was all white uh, essentially the standard for these this household unit was at any point of any day um, somebody could come in there with a white glove and wipe it on any surface of that room and there would not be uh, their finger would not be dirty right nothing. that was the minimum standard yeah, for all that, these spaces that room was particularly i mean that it was like a nasa clean room it was absolutely insane. And yeah, that was their course room. It had black more, it had those black, like, uh, uh, I don't know the material, black stone polished floors, dark yeah. tables. It had this very kind of Spanish, you know, wrought iron and carved yeah. furniture. And I just assumed that was Knights of the Round Table. I didn't know there was another thing. So well, I could you be. Grew up, you grew up in a cult. So, I did. I, <laughs> I went to art school, so I would know that. Yeah. Exactly. That's one of the few things I would know. <laughs> yeah, so I'm trying to think if there's any, I mean, really, we'd probably have to watch the film and there you can't really see these films outside of Scientology. It's very, very rare yeah. um, for these films um, to have been shown unless they were like TR1, um, TRs in Life and EM1 were both considered public films in addition to training right. films. Right. So they were shown, there was time periods where both of those films were shown on cable TV or cable access or, right. Um, right. or public access TV. So if anybody has a recording or knows of a recording of any of these Scientology films, um, hook us up, let us know and we'll, we'll show it. But um, for this film, um, I don't know of a, a trailer. Did we ever do a trailer? No. I don't think we did a, we ever shot no, a trailer. No. We stopped doing trailers after a while altogether because it was just a stupid idea. Yeah, so, so for a while, there was all of these films that were shot. And then um, I can't remember. I think it was a program that David Miscavige f dug up from something that L. Ron Hubbard had written, you know, yeah. 20 or 30 years prior that said that there should be ads for these films that would be either shown on uh, the beginnings of other films or they would be shown in an area of the organization right. that would encourage people to sign up for training. And the only way that you can see many of these Scientology films is if you've signed up for a course in right. Scientology. That, that was the big deal that he actually thought he actually thought that people would want to see these films so bad that they'd sign up for a course so they could see it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like imagine the, whatever the next Marvel film comes out. Yes. It's on a course more, that yeah, you have to pay to, to do. See it, you have to go in and do the course. I mean, he likened these films to like, if they were the next Marvel course coming out. And so then what he wanted to do, he wanted to put trailers on the films that would then try to get you to want to see the next, you know, Marvel Scientology training film on some other course. And we used to shoot, shoot these stupid trailers. I mean, I, I wrote a, I wrote some. I hated doing that, but I, you know, you know. It was also it was a job. time. Yeah, it was also a time when. Um, we didn't have a lot to shoot because some films needed more money or needed a bigger space or there were physical constraints that yeah. we were not able to overcome to be able to do that film at that time. And it was it was recognized by everyone that we needed something to do meanwhile. And that was a, a period where doing event videos and doing other things was welcomed because it would keep us busy. Right. But, but it wasn't really forwarding our division or our departments sort of end game so these trailers yeah. were gonna yeah. do that and they were actually it, it oddly enough before i got into the cinematography division i was the one responsible for putting those trailers onto laser disc and right. we would we were producing laser discs um these trailers on laser discs and i think we may have even done a, like four or five different ones that actually made it to laser disc and wow. showed and um of course now i mean 
you'd be very lucky to get your hands on a laser disc or a laser disc player. I happen to have both, um, but um, <laughs> but only because there's a Depeche Mode laser disc and I needed something to play it on. So that's well, you, it. why don't you digitize it? Uh, oh no, I have the other updated oh. versions that are on VHS or yeah. DVD and otherwise. But um, but it's it's a collector thing. Yeah, anyway. it's fun. It's like LPs. I mean, it's it's great. Exactly. Yeah, that whole wall behind me. Oh, by the way, for those of you who didn't notice, I did update my lighting. It used to be this was my, you know, my lighting setup in here was this dark cave, bl bl uh, black and red. Prince and, of darkness. And I was are. asked to lighten it up a little bit. So now I have it so you can see that entire cabinet behind me, each one of those little squares is filled with LPs and uh, DVDs and VHS and cassettes and buttons and stickers for each of those albums. So I have a uh, I have a lot of LPs and laser discs, and nice. uh, just because nice. I'm a bizarre collector, um, I can't. Rem so without re without watching the film, I can't easily recall any kind of catchphrases yeah, or any kind. No, of there was no catchphrases from that film. It was pretty inconsequential. I, I remember for me one of the weirdest things in the whole film was. When you're a student or a, a, a pair of twins, the study partners, as they call them, yeah, you're you're not going to ever stop. You're never going to stop in the middle and have a chit chat. You're never going to stop and make a comment. When you're doing these drills, you're doing these drills. Yeah. And if, if you stop to comment or do something, those supervisor is going to come over because he's assuming you either need help or you're you're goofing off, right? And there's this one scene, you know, the the these two characters, they're trying to get this this intention thing and it, it doesn't exist it's a mental trick that you play on yourself you know when you're screaming in an ashtray and you're picking it up and then you actually go oh i did it i got the ashtray to stand up and you actually believe this uh you've tricked yourself into it so one of the characters it's the 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 uh the lima Sperla character he all of a sudden breaks character and uh, not breaks character but he breaks the drill and he's like I did it, right? He does this thing where I did it. Yeah. And then the supervisor, you're not supposed to be commenting. You're not, you're supposed to just stay with it. Yeah. Like you raise your hand at that point and you ask the supervisor to come over and watch you do it so he could verify you're doing it. And they have started having this moment. And the direction to the supervisor is first, he thinks they did something wrong. And then, like, he realizes that he should let them have their win. This is like, and it, films are not about what a person is thinking. Yes. They're, they're about what people do. and But Hubbard would script these things about what people were thinking, and they just drove me crazy figuring out ways that I could get that, that message out. Because if I didn't, I mean, I was like, you know, I, I screwed up, right? Yeah. So that film had a, one of the particularly trying ones. Uh, Nice. I just saw in here. I'm um, sorry. I, I, no. No. It says, um, tell Peri, per, Perian, tell Perian. Um, it said, um, tell Perian. Um, it said, you had one down vote on the fundraiser. Wonder who that was coming from. I think they were talking about the earlier stream that we did. Um, yeah, right. yeah, no, I'm pretty sure we know who that came from. That's okay, guys. <laughs> Somebody um, Somebody did like a thumbs down. Yeah, on, a fun, yeah, well, on an aftermath fundraiser. Yeah, like how to <laughs> how to be assigned as a complete A <laughs> yeah. on YouTube. Just do that. Um, is there anything else that we want to cover on this? Otherwise, I was thinking we could go to some of the questions. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this this was a relatively inconsequential film. We didn't have trouble with the talent because they were they were staff and then 90 percent of the film took place in one course room so the size of the studio was not a big problem yeah then, that and that and that's a good thing and this is where this um i think we mentioned it in the previous video that l ron hubbard had dictated many years prior that the shoot crew that's shooting these films would get a minimum of 16 shots in the can each day and yeah. the reason it says in the can is because we had a film a film came in cans and once you finished a shot it would get taken out of the camera and it would go into a can so yeah it was cool it's, it's, yeah it's like kind of came from hollywood we got yeah. this shot in the can meaning it's on its exactly. way to the laboratory so the the minimum standard in the shoot crew was 16 shots in the can yeah. per day and so if you didn't have to change a set 
or you didn't have to change to a location and you could just switch angles and your lighting was all set for all the different angles, then we could usually, we could pretty much easily crank out at least 16 shots a day. And if we were doing that and the shots were high quality, um, that was a bonus because also if we shot 16 shots and Dave disapproved four mm -hmm. shots, then we only got for uh, 12 we shots again only count that. that we could only count the ones that got approved yeah. by david miscavige and and for the people that are wondering yes the the mitch um i i mentioned this in a um in a video one of the spy files video but they have a, a form in scientology whenever you're asking for something to get reviewed by someone in scientology you have to write a form a, a proposal and it's called completed staff work and it has the situation the data and the solution so mitch every day would have to write a, a csw completed staff work to david miscavige himself and it went from who did it go it went from you it it changed over the years. Yeah, it would depend. It, it would it would. This is weird. This is a political thing. When we were doing really well, then every executive wanted to get on the routing, because then it's like, oh look, you know, da 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 da. Um, so eventually, there was so many executives on the routing, it would go like, from me to the city, the divisional secretary to the commanding officer, to you know somebody in technical to, and then finally, and then. Dave would flip out. Yeah. And, and then he'd say, no, it's coming straight to me. You know, apparently I'm harder to reach than the Pope. Yes. You know, he, he'd say this crazy shit. Like he'd find my submission on somebody's desk. Yes. Him, and he'd, they'd get sent to the RPF because they delayed it. it was, that was a crazy thing. So, but yeah, every day. And then I would usually see him every day. Yeah. Like we would have dinner and I would, right after dinner, I would do the rushes and send it up. And then uh, I would often after their dinner uh, they would be in the he would be in the in the theater watching the film and so i'd often try to position myself so i was just happened to be hanging out when he came out well so, also the theater was just a one building away from mitch's office yeah it was like almost next door and so. invariably david miscavige would would come down to eat and that the, the yeah. building where he ate his meals in at that time was also on the other side of mitch's office so on one side was the theater yeah and on the other side yeah. was the dining room and mitch's office was conveniently located right yeah. in between those two yeah, he couldn't go from the theater to dinner or back without, without walking. walking right yeah. by mitch's office and the big windows one story ground you know is and it's so one yeah. of those things where if mitch is in there sitting in the office and dave walks by and sees him he's gonna yeah, they're gonna have a conversation it would be rude if mitch didn't come out or if yeah. dave didn't go in it would be rude if they saw each other and didn't have some sort of interchange yeah, i think we had a lot of conversations yeah so but but either way the only two people that were always on this submission that mitch wrote up was mitch and dave those yeah. were the two people that were on yeah. every single one of those regardless of who was in the middle on the way to dave but right right but so mitch would write us the csw and it would and it would literally be i mean you might have one of these but it would be like situation the rushes for tr7 for today need to be approved right. um data yeah. here are the shots and mitch would lay out which shots we did and it would be solution approve these yeah. shots for yeah. the film and um and that happened every single day and now correct me if i'm wrong but so the shots that you'd be show we would be submitting on a tuesday would have been the shots that we shot on monday went to the lab yeah. got developed came back through the night they would either be cut together right. um made into a reel of all right. of the shots that we were proposing and maybe some outtakes or alternates if they were needed and then that would be sort of during the whole day assembled and then after dinner you'd write right. a csw yeah 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 yeah. we we would do well there was a policy about it you'd you'd break for dinner you'd have your dinner you the shoot day would end at dinner it was supposed to five to yeah. five o'clock yeah then you go to dinner then right after dinner you would do the csw and submit it and then he would come down and watch the stuff and we don't we, generally speaking we would meet there was so much paperwork going back and forth. One time I was up in the RTC office before they built the $50 million monstrosity, you know, when it was up in the villas. Yeah. I, I never had any reason to go up there. Um, Claire can verify that she never saw, never saw me up there. One no. time 
Well, maybe. when you would write that submission, somebody would, um, there would be a person who would yeah. assemble all that, and Mitch would really just sign, he'd help with writing it, but no, no, somebody would, would type it. it. Yeah. I know, but didn't somebody type it? No, I typed the whole thing. I mean, the, the, okay. it, it was about an hour's worth of work. The biggest problem with it was gathering all the information, all the script notes and the camera notes and, you know, tabbing the script and all the administrative stuff. And I eventually, they got me somebody to do that, but I'd have to type it because I'd have to explain why I shot a shot, how the way I did, how it was going to be used in the edit. And then my immediate senior, quote unquote, would often look at what I wrote and go, no, it's not enough. You need to write more or, you know, or why are you saying that? People love to just everybody. They like to be to be micromanagers. They just they, yeah, they, 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 which could have been a bless or a curse at the time because if somebody said like pull Mitch in, find out why he said this. This is super bizarre why yeah, he would mention yeah. this. And then so somebody would get Mitch and they'd get him on the e meter or they just ask him and they say hey yeah. why did you write this and be like oh I didn't write that. Uh, Billy oh, Bob, yeah. my senior, yeah. the guy that was over me said we should put that in there because oh, that's yeah. no, the way I, it went. And it'd be like yeah. and so then it would immediately oh. that person would okay. not would be gone. You wouldn't see yeah, that person yeah. ever again. Well, Mark, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I sometimes if I really objected to the person saying, you know, I don't think you should put that in there, I, I say, okay, I'll write in here that you thought I shouldn't put it in here. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then well, some, yeah. or well, sometimes you'd say, well, Baba Boss said we should do this and too, so we'll look at that. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, taking any ownership in your yeah. idea. I'm, I'm putting yeah. it off over here and showing that it's your idea. Yeah, I tried to be, I tried to be really transparent, but I want to go back to this idea, Mark, about the 16 shots a day. Yeah. Because this is, this is a quota and it's laid down as a law in Cine, and um, it's absolutely psychotic way. It, it, it's like judging your progress through a script by the number of shots you did a day. It's like judging how far you've made it on a road trip by counting the number of times you stopped to take a pee. Okay, the two things literally have nothing to do with one another. The standard way of doing it in Hollywood is by fractions of a page. Yes. They actually use eighths of a page, and I'll tell you why. I have randomly a piece of paper here, and if you fold a piece of paper in half once, in half twice, and a half three times, you have a piece of paper. This is magic, my magic trick. You have a piece of paper that's divided into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eighths, and that's how they do it. So you don't even need a ruler. They make it really easy. But on in the motion picture industry, scripts are product uh, progress through a film is measured in the eighths of pages, but at Gold, it's measured in 16 shots a day. Now, y you you could shot, and I proved this one day. I sat there on a film and we did one sequence, half a page, and I shot 30 shots. <laughs> yes, and I remember everybody, this. Everybody was like, what? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we're screwed because at this rate, we're not going to make it. Yeah, so it, it just uh, that was a battle that I had with them forever. To it was also it, it also kind of curtailed um, certain creative ideas. Like maybe if you had um, a sequence that was made up of ten different shots, but if there was a way you could do all that in one shot, yeah, then well, you, you wouldn't want to yeah, do that yeah, because then no, now we just no, did a whole day's work and we only got one shot where if there was 16 right. shots all together, we could have right. done each one of them and we maybe could have thrown in an over the shoulder or a close up or a two shot in yeah. addition to those. Yeah, it was totally, totally corrupt. You know, like the day, you know, there would be some days like when we blew up the CIA headquarters at, at Norton where we had four cameras. Yes. Right? And, you know, it's, you do two takes with four cameras that's eight shots right there yeah and we love those also because if you blew something up that what was was also Ooh, called special effects an sfx shot and right. sfx shots were double right. so if you blew something up you had four cameras and you did a bunch of different angles you could get 30 something shots and in one go just by blowing something up and we did we blew a lot of stuff up and we set a lot of stuff on fire we did we blew up a building remember in uh, the problem of life we blew up a tree yeah, we got to <laughs> save those for those movies, though. But yeah, we, we could we, talk uh, about Problems of Life because it's not even on our list. And I don't even know. I mean, I was in that film, too. I In that were. film, I was a jaywalker um, that almost got run over. And we didn't... Uh, <clears throat> 
we didn't have a um like a movie vehicle or picture vehicle or something like that we were shooting on first street bridge and the camera was across the street and to make it look like i was jaywalking i would run out into live traffic and then back back up yeah, into yeah. the sidewalk right. because a car was actually going to run me over <laughs> right, right right it wasn't hey, you were, staged you, you were supposed to step into the street almost yeah. get hit and then jump back on the sidewalk yeah that was your action. It was my wrong room, but in the street. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and you did it for real. <laughs> yes, it was awesome. That We shot that one with, that one I had the angel from TR14. That was Katie Mitchell and Mark Toddy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Katie, Problems yeah. of life, right? Yeah, the problem The problem of life. The problem of life. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I realized yesterday, Mark, when we were, the other thing I wanted to mention from yesterday yeah. is that we were going around uh, trying to figure out for a minute it was at 14 tr films or was there 15 i said tr 15 yeah yeah then i went no there's 16 of them because i i you know but the fact that i'm forgetting this it's good this means i'm healing up people. yeah my trauma is slowly <laughs> leaking out of my body because this shit, you know you i could still wake up at four in the morning you could wake me up but i can give you a book one session yes that and also i must say um for the video's sake we shot a film and in that film l ron hubbard scripted that we would there would be explosive placed at this building it was not the real fbi we didn't really blow anything up it was a model of a building that we had shot at and it happened to be a very iconic building in los angeles right yeah, off the, the freeway the, the sunkiss building which looked like it was very similar to the cia building so if you shot a small portion of it out of focus it really looked like the langley headquarters of the CIA. yeah so we did not blow up any real buildings yeah, in the but making of any model, of these movies mark when you say model yes you, it, we're talking this was a seven tenths model this thing was, <laughs> i want to say it, it was half scale no, Isn't I it it half? Was, no, I think it was over half because really, it, it was it giant. Was, yeah, <laughs> remember it, it was big. It, it was about twenty <laughs> feet tall, and it was about sixty feet That's wide. That's true. I think that it was a calculation, right? You have to make a calculation when you yeah. blow up something. Yeah. it has to be at a certain size in order for the framing and the frame rate and everything to well, make it look yeah, real. It's mostly the frame rate because if you build something at half scale, then you have to double the speed of the film to get the motion to match. So, yeah yeah we had that all down and then we had yeah. our old friend dennis de young who had a, a <gasps> dennis dion Dion, yeah he had a slight uh, stimulant problem <laughs> well he, always, he he was very he famous started. in the special effects industry because he had um done i think it was either a die hard movie or yeah. it was some action movie and he put like if you were supposed to put uh let's say 100 gallons of gas in the car to blow it up he yeah. put 150 just for good yeah. measure yeah. and when the car blew up the fireball reached the main actors of the film like yeah let's just say bruce willis and somebody else and so when the fire reached the at when the fireball gets to the main talent that's too much fire that that's not that's yeah. more fire than yeah. we want and so it was a big flap and they blew up the car the shot was amazing the talent yeah. were a little singed and might have had a little hair burnt or whatever but um they went to dennis and they said dennis I mean, that was a lot of fire. It was a big fireball. What would you do if, if you did it again? What would you do? And he goes, add more gas. And um, so he had t-shirts that just said, add more gas. And yeah. when he would come yeah. and do a shoot, he'd give them out to the crew <laughs> yeah. and, you know, a free t-shirt. I mean, yeah. that's, it's, Sea Org members are very, very um, uh, susceptible to, to, to swag. Okay. Yeah. If you've got yeah. a free water bottle or a t-shirt, the Sea Org yeah. member is going to sign up for that all day long. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all used to, uh, Remember, we all used to go to the, the, the what's it called? The film, uh, the big film con, the equipment. What the hell is it called? Cine the, Expo. Yeah, the, in LA, where it's just yeah. all manufacturers, and you could yeah. go there and get <laughs> yeah. lots of water bottles and t shirts yeah. and hats and all kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, cool Studio stuff. Depot or whoever the Cine, yeah. Cine whatever the, 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 what was that? There was a place that we used to get um, film expendables tools. from. Film tools, yes, yeah, film was tools. One, uh, there was another one, I forget the name of it, but yeah. Yeah, but those guys would, they, those guys, we'd be wearing their stuff until the next year the convention was happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great stuff. Okay, we We've got uh, just a few minutes left here. Let's okay. take some of these um, questions here. Uh, oh, look, Bets, Betsu, Betsu, Betsy Sue, Bet C S U. Um, Thanks for that. Betsy. Switch Betsy. to Mitch's channel. Disappointed with Judy. <laughs> Sorry, it's 
Judy okay. Norton Taylor. Oh, she's oh yeah. Sorry, Judy. We had to throw some shade at Judy. Yeah, um, Carolyn, thank you. She sent a super sticker. Thank you for that. Um, this is a perfect time to do this while Mitch is dealing with his uh, his uh, canine there. Uh, Joni Cummings. Thank you, Joni. I appreciate it. I see Joni on all the channels. I was on a, I tuned into uh, a live chat that Denver Stevo was doing last night, and Joni was in there. Um, thank you for that, Joni. We appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you very much. Um, Destiny Salazar, Mitch, thank you so much for coming out and speaking so honestly about your experience. It is so important to paint a full picture of this dangerous organization. Well, you're very welcome, and thanks for the super chat. And and uh, you know, uh, some of that my thanks goes to Mark, who's definitely been a, an inspiration and a platform and, and helpful in all of this. So. Thank you. you. Know, your love for him is not misplaced. I appreciate it, Mitch. Yeah, no problem. Um, April in Amsterdam. Thank you for that. I'd love to actually see a film. I don't really get what these films are for. Who sees them? Are they for OT levels, auditors, staff? It's kind of confusing to this never inner. Um, well, to be fair, the, there's the, we, there's two types of films. There's these TR films and the EM films. And all of these films are for people that are training inside of Scientology right, to learn right. how to do Scientology counseling. That's I the simple. I, yeah, I think I can, I can answer this. Here's the best answer I think I could give to this. In 1963, and don't worry, I'm not going to gas bag forever here. Um, everybody settle down. Uh, no. In 1963, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, when he was running St. Hill in England, he did a film lecture called An Afternoon at St. Hill. And in that lecture, he came out and very, you know, swaggering and put his foot up on his, you know, in front of his stately manner. And he proclaimed that Scientology would only go so far as it was taught properly. And it could only be taught properly if you could see it being done. And it could only, you could only see it being done if there was film. So he, 1963, he proclaimed to the world of Scientology that Scientology would not make it with only him teaching people and that there had to be films. Then when he went to La Quinta later in the 70s, he started working on these films. He was on the run from the FBI and a bunch of lawsuits. And so he took some time and called those people up from L.A., uh, you know, threw up in his mouth when he saw their auditing skills. And that's why we made them. And so basically, when you take a Scientology training course to learn to be an auditor, you have what's called a check sheet. And this check sheet lays out on it everything you have to do to complete that level of training. And so these films would be on the check sheet. Some of them would be on one check sheet. Some of them would be on a different check sheet. You were never eligible to see all of them at once unless you completed all the courses. You could always go back and ask to see them. And some That's of the true. Films, you could of, also, you know, if, if you were on a course, like let's say the Solo Auditor course, there is a right. film called the Solo Auditor film. You right. could watch that film 150 times if yeah, you wanted to on did. one while you were on that course and also the films to be honest the films were sort of like a break from having yeah. to sit in the course room and oh, well, read and try to like understand all of l ron hubbard's gobbledygook so if you could go in the film room you could take a nap that's one that was one yeah, bonus and you could also just there. watch the film because it was fun or at least more fun than sitting in the course room listening to l ron hubbard or reading l ron hubbard's um lectures or yeah, the materials you could, you could get out of, yeah if you wanted to as we would call it blow <laughs> yeah, it was blow the course room it was a welcome break from the course room going yeah. to see a film and the films would show um all of these different films would show at different times so they'd actually be like a theater room or a film room was what we called them right. and, so, and some organizations had multiple film rooms right. but there'd be a film schedule so if you were if you had done or you were on a certain set of courses if you if you played the system you could go watch three or four films in an yeah. afternoon or yeah, you maybe got points right that's right you got points you got wait a minute in Scientology, I talk about this thing where everybody has a statistic. And if so, I was working in the cassette area. So number of cassettes checked or whatever was my statistic. Well, when you go to study in Scientology as a student, you also have a statistic and it's called student points. And everything that you read or study or do has a certain point value assigned to it. And films had a pretty good point value. And the supervisors, the people that are in charge of doing the of the students, 
their stat is also student points. So they will encourage you to go see a film because just sitting there reading is the lowest amount of points you can get. Right. But if you're in a film room, it's like, I don't remember what it is because I didn't do a lot of studying and I certainly yeah. weren't, wasn't watching the films because I shot the dang things. Yeah, but, um, was, but you, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just just saying this. The, so everybody was sort of on board to, to push people to watch these films. Oh, the yeah, whole that, system. It was a big deal. Yeah. And, 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 and you may not have watched a lot of the films, but you worked on those theaters. I mean, those. Film I did. Rooms, those film rooms were. They were five point one. They best were. It was ridiculous. Best speakers. <laughs> yeah. Like it was insanely tuned by top audio experts yeah we like, actually had an acoustician uh, acoustician yeah acoustician. Good, good. Well, i'll go with that yeah his name was uh what the hell was it? paul yeah paul Veniclausen. you can look him up he passed away his company's still around yeah Veniclausen and associates i think it's called yeah or they like that. design like the inside of like disney hall and stuff the philharmonic they're still around look them up they're the top acousticians in the whole world. Just I mean, they literally, we told them, these are the size rooms we want to build. What's the most optimum way to build them so yeah, that they, they sound as good as possible? Yeah. And then those, that's what we were building. So yeah, our, it was, our, yeah, Paul, he was like a, like a, like a, I don't know, like a priest, high priest of sound. He did a bunch of work for gold when, when we were there, when he yeah. was still alive. He built so, all yeah, the echo you, chambers and all these different rooms, things. This is not like your high school AV. No, this was some serious stuff. This was like, yeah, it was had, it was sort of be, over the top to be. It had to, to be, be flawless, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there was all there was so many different things. And this was sort of the ironic thing of the, all this attention on these films. And even at this time, when Mitch is talking about in the early 1990s, we would do all this work to make these films. And the end product was they were being played on 16 mal, uh, 16 millimeter film with mag stripe. And um, it's a magnetic stripe that's on the right. side of the film. And that's where the audio is recorded onto. And that stuff would flake off and make the films really dirty. So even even though all this attention was put on shooting the films and making them sound great and making they would uh, inevitably, inevitably sound horrible because the mag stripe would fall off of the film right. and there wouldn't be any more sound in that spot and then also they'd be really dirty from all that um, the emulsion that the audio had in it would get mixed right. with the film emulsion it was a big mess yeah. so in the 2000s that was my job was i digitized all of right. these film rooms and we were now using computer systems and hd right. projectors and so um it, it it took a very long time for people to actually to be able to see the films that we had shot in a high enough quality that you could hear and see them clearly yeah 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 absolutely but eventually it happened plus it made it easier to take a nap because once they were digital <laughs> yeah. the, 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 you didn't need a projectionist who'd have to stand there he just that's true there was leave. nobody watching the film yeah. room so you could just do those off yeah. do whatever that's true it was all automated the lights and the yeah. and, and some film rooms that was all kind of uh show control automation yeah. the film would play the lights would go down yeah. we'd do everything so yeah okay. and also also the, the fact that they were digital it meant that they could use some heavy, heavy, heavy encryption. Yeah. So that like nobody at the org, nobody at the church can get anywhere near those files. There's like a, a you know, there's probably two people in Los Angeles and one person in other cities who works for gold and they go in there with a the hard drive and they can load a film onto the system. And these yeah. things are, they're like Mission Impossible. If you try to break them, you know, they'll burst into flames. And all yeah, they're not connected to the internet. If somebody yeah. tries to auth uh, it, uh, unauthorized access of the media, it'll burn itself down. There's all sorts of fail safe. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm hoping somebody will just shoot one with a cell phone. I know of two different people that have copies, but they're not giving them out and but yeah if, if if somebody wants to go in a film room and they accidentally push record while they're watching a the film and then send it to us i mean i don't know if that's the worst thing in the world that could happen but i'm not encouraging and i'm just saying if it happens to happen it might happen yeah but. yeah i've heard that it might happen that's all i'm gonna <laughs> yeah. say that's, that's um, good news <laughs> Let's so. get to the last of these questions. It says, okay. It's Joseph Barton says, Hey, Mark and Mitch, just wanted to say I love this new series. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, that's good. We yeah, want to. Best, best is yet to come. I don't know what to say. We do have a lot. Um, as we get to some of these, there are stories that you guys are going to love. To um, your toes. <laughs> Betsy Sue says, Betsy Sue, Betsy Savannah, to be exact. Well, oh. thank you, Betsy Savannah, uh, Susanna. We appreciate the super chats. Um, and then Denver Stevo, are there. 
Are these training? Did I say this? No. Um, Denver Stevo says, are there any of these training videos able to be seen outside of Scientology? Bootlegs, appropriated copies, etc. I would love to see the work you guys, you gents did back at the time. Well, yeah, we just kind of covered that. There's not, that's one of the reasons why you really don't see these anywhere is because unless you are in a Scientology organization inside the film room on one of these specific courses, right. you not even general Scientology Scientologists are allowed to just walk in and watch these things. You have to be right. training on a course right. in a Scientology organization. And even that is a very rare thing to be doing lately. I've, well, I've talked to people who've days, left. Yeah, these yeah. days, there could be one or two people training yeah. at a Scientology organization. And those are the least likely people to whip out their phone and video one of these things. So yeah. it's, it's, But one can always hope. What's yes. life without a dream? Yes, right? exactly. Like, yeah, but, you know, somebody asked earlier, I just want to mention, somebody asked, what they're all about and they said you know are they for auditing are they for ot's and there are ot films yes we didn't shoot these are from saint hill they're black and white and those uh, are those are l ron hubbard specifically telling uh, you about these upper level yeah uh, these aliens. are the uh, yeah and so i spent um i spent a couple of years doing a a project to restore these films I, if you watch my video on the insights, the true story of, of Inside Golden Era Productions, whatever, I did like a, like a response video to that. And I talk a little bit about the restoration of those, those OT films. And I've also written a little about it in my book. Those are the films that if they ever leaked out, that would be the end of Scientology. Oh, yeah. But, These yeah, are very... You saw Hubbard lecturing himself about the OT levels. I mean, even when I was doing them, I'm like, I don't know. This guy seems kind of crazy. Yeah, so, it, 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 it's, it seems like uh, unhinged is a good way of putting it. If yeah, and he doesn't, he doesn't talk about Zeno and BTs on these films. He talks about the stuff that you do after you know that story. Yes. And that's the stuff that nobody talks about, like what the reactive mind is made of. Yeah. And, and what the actual component things that are your problem like he breaks this down and it's pretty crazy. So yes, there are, to answer that question, there are other films. They're filmed lectures of L. Ron Hubbard. They're horrible quality because apparently, as I've pointed out, the person that he hired to shoot them. His name was Reg. Yeah, yeah, Reg Sharp, right, was his name? I can't remember his last name, but I remember there's a lot of, whenever there would be footage we'd want to use or we'd want to do this, be like, oh, that's one of those Reg things. We're probably going to have to clean that up if we're going to use it. Yeah, because apparently- Whoever this guy was, he just couldn't, he couldn't run a focus on a lens no, or he couldn't no. frame to to save his life. Yeah, so there were millions and millions- He'd of move the camera in the middle of the shoot. No, no, he, he would zoom in. <laughs> And the whole image would go out of focus and he'd zoom in and he just missed the shot. It was so horrible. And so we spent, I spent thousands of hours and the church spent tens of millions of dollars and then boasted about restoring these films <laughs> yeah. forward just to make them look like they weren't shot, you know, that they were shot somewhat correctly. It just it was really jokes up. But I did all the restorations like that was my project. And so there's even body doubles and inserts on Hubbard's hands that aren't him. You yeah, know, we did all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. So, yeah, there are these other films. I, I hope someday one of them gets out because they're, nice. they're really nutty. Uh, yeah, they are crazy. Oh, here's a good one. Joe DeSeppo says, Mitch told me to do this with his OT powers. I there did, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, I did. Like, I, you just got to do that more, Mitch, yeah, and you'll Joe, you'll be good. Joe's going to show up and give us two pounds. <laughs> um, Malini's Malina Malinas. Um, Mark Claire is giving you lots of example of catchphrases. I'm crocheting a dungeon here. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't know what any of that means, but I will yeah. gladly uh, read that out. Hey, Tiff what forty five. About, what about this one here? Okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm getting them all. Unless yeah. you got one, you can tell me. No, Mitch no, no, needs I, more. Yeah, Mitch needs more strokes, guys. You are so interesting, Mitch. Give yourself <laughs> some credit. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, all my cards are maxed out. <laughs> no, I think uh, you said yeah. gas bag. I think that was what the, oh, what spurred that uh, comment. It, it showed up right after you said gas. You you don't want oh, a yeah. gas bag anymore. Yeah, though. perfect. No, but somebody asked. It wasn't. It was just if we worked on any of the music videos. Yeah, we did. We did not work on We Stand Tall. That was both before Let me just us. Put that like in huge, huge lettering. 
Yeah, I've got the comment right here. Jenna from Cali, question. Mitch and Mark, were you involved in the Scientology music videos? They look like they're from the 80s and everybody looks weird. <laughs> well, no, we did. We did. Actually, Mark didn't work on it, but we, the first one I did was We Are the Auditors. Which, yeah. Which actually looks pretty good. And then you and I, we did the one where we almost killed Tommy Davis, where we put him up on a mountaintop. Come on, you were yes. part of that, right? But I don't remember what the music video was. Was it? Um, uh, maybe it was the "What Is Happiness." The, maybe it was. Yeah. Just, oh no, no, it was the sun never sets on Scientology. The sun never sets. Yes. Yeah, the sun. And we went. We went to Temecula, and we we got a hot, hot air balloons. You were on that. Yes, I remember. We I got remember. a hot air. This is back when they let me spend money and do the most. <laughs> yes. Oh, and to be to just to tell you a little bit of backstory about that, when we shot films, it was a fixed um, income source that we would get money from to shoot the films. Right. So it wasn't just like we had a, a an unlimited budget. We had to. Right. We really had to turn in a budget that was yeah. as low as it possibly. Yeah. But when we would do an event video, that or or a music video that came out from a completely different piggy bank yeah. and we would often load up when we would do so like we could never get expendables on the film team for years yeah. we couldn't yeah. get like the makeup guys couldn't get tissues and those little gel, sponges gel. and hair gel and they could i mean they just couldn't get any money to buy that so they'd spend their own money on on q-tips or yeah. on sponges to apply makeup and and they would they, they would put in their their proposal i need to buy sponges because i've been using the same sponges on all the talent for for months and months like they're using the makeup from the sponge they used on the last person so no no anyway so um when we would do an event video we would load up on expendables yeah, and those people them. weren't usual seers of the budgets for films so they didn't know what any of these things were so we just write expendables and we just go crazy with yeah, like four thousand I mean, bucks yeah we had like remember that you mentioned the what is happiness or whatever it is we had like 200 extras marching on the first street bridge I mean, yeah paid extras and some staff members but on that particular i think one, that was the one we used jack maxwell for too that's, that's the one that's yeah the one i mean we literally had a crowd of people on the first street but we got i want at the end of this you know sun never sets in scientology i wanted to have a hot air balloon with a, a scientology logo on the side of it you know like 20 feet high and then have this and then shoot it from another hot air balloon or a helicopter other <laughs> yeah. as it drifted off into the sun right yeah this was like an expensive shoot so you know we used to get away but we we took um it wasn't on that one but another one of these ones we took tommy davis when he worked at celebrity center before he was pop before he was working yeah. with tom cruise and david no, miscavige he was just ann archer's kid and he happened to be in the sea org yeah but <laughs> and he, he was a celebrity wrangler i don't know what yeah he way. worked in the president's office yeah, at like celebrity we'll, center we'll talk about it but when we did the film with isaac hayes isaac wasn't available he lived in new york he was only available on weekends and so tommy would he got the job of flying to new york on friday afternoon picking up isaac flying back and then he'd hang out with him at the base the whole yeah, time Isaac but, was shooting. He would drill lines with him on the plane. Isaac couldn't ever remember lines. <laughs> he couldn't well, also. He his brain. I I'll tell you this. <laughs> Isaac. We'll talk about this when we do that film in more detail. But Isaac Hayes's brain was not wired to read L. Ron Hubbard's writings. No, it just no. he could not get through a sentence yeah. without with one sentence written by L. Ron Hubbard. He could not read it from start to finish without putting the inflection on something or just not understanding oh, it. Oh, it's or... a cultural thing, man. He wanted, oh, my to, he wanted goodness. to hover like it was written in the hood. We had, I mean, literally, he was like, I would never say that. And we're like, yeah. we know, Isaac, but we don't care what you are saying. Yeah. It, you have to yeah. read this exactly. We yeah. cannot, he said, it, we would say, if you don't read it the way it's written, next we weekend when you come, we'll be reshooting it. Yeah. So you have to read it yeah. this way. Yeah, but he, what a great guy. What, he was what, amazing. He was the coolest dude. And yeah. this dude had stories. If we, we would get, we would almost get in trouble yeah. for just listening to Isaac instead yeah. of shooting. Like, it'd be like, Tommy would be like, are you guys going to shoot? Or are we yeah. just going to yap with Isaac? And be yeah, like, he, hey, you shut up over there, Tommy boy. Okay, we, we're having fun. <laughs> yeah, Isaac, he loved people. I don't know how else to say it. He just He was a good dude. People. Yeah, so uh, anyway, I think that's all I wanted to say. Somebody at Xenu Project asked. Uh, oh, Mitch is going rogue here, reading the comments. Yeah, um, sorry, I just. It's okay. Where are you? If you, 
we got to figure out how we can um you just have to tell me the time if you tell me if you know oh, yeah, one 312 312 okay good then i can go to that time and find it um, that's why you were the shuker chief and i was the director that's true well <laughs> i think there's other reasons but either way um for both of our positions being what they were um here we go 312 312 sorry guys i'm just coming up on yeah. uh, this question what and who's it from who do you it's remember what it's new project Free Zenu project, okay. And I am at the three twelves. I'm scrolling through. Yeah, I'm sorry, Zenu I won't project. do that again. Hopefully, it was on. Oh yeah, I have it. Three. No, I don't see it. Sorry. Well, I could just read it. He wanted to know. Yeah. He wanted to know was DM the guy shooting any of those, or did you deal with any <laughs> of the DM filmed crap? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. So the, I don't know. I actually don't know for certain which exact films that Dave Miscavige shot. I think. The films that he shot only at La Quinta. Yeah, were oh, it was a, a few films, yeah. and and the funny thing is, is that whenever L. Ron Hubbard would say something to the film crew in in a, in writing, that would be made into what's called a cine executive directive, or right. it would be made into a policy, and he they would just kind of strip out some of the personal details, but because of my position, I was able to see the original writings that um, L. Ron Hubbard had written in response to a shot or in response to a crew, and he was not kind to Dave Miscavige on multiple no. occasions yeah. about how horrible of a camera person he was and yeah. i think one of the most famous um writings which we all loved to to reference was he assigned um david miscavige david miscavige was the chief cameraman and his assistant cameraman was mark yeager and there was a time when he assigned both of them lowered conditions um for their horrible movie um shooting for their film work. yeah 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 one thing okay so there's these Mark mentioned there's these cine EDs, these cinema executive, cinematography executive directors, and one would think like listen, one says how to properly record sound, whatever, blah, and and one would think that Hubbard just sat down to write this very instructional, but that's not. I got a hold of the original ones. The original ones were what we call dispatches, like a, a like a memo to a person excoriating them for doing something wrong, like. You know, you like the one to Miscavige, you really screwed this up. You know, you're a total idiot. I, he would just rip into people. Then he would tell you how to do it right. You should have done it like this. Then and that's somebody, with the part that would make the policy yeah, letter. <laughs> somebody, would, somebody would edit all the bad stuff out. Yeah. And, it would be, and I went and got a hold of the original communications from Hubbard on these things because I wanted to just read them myself. It was embarrassing. Like 500, he wrote 500 of these NEDs. That means there were 500 major flaps. Yeah, and that, that is happened. usually where, uh, yeah, that's almost, and and people think, wow, that's kind of crazy. That's how he came up with the policies for the cinematography. No, no, no. That's how all of yeah. the policies of Scientology came up. Oh, yeah, like up. the one, I got it, like the, on the ship, there was some rumor that the guys on the ship, there was a lot of sex and they were having, there was some orgy. And then somebody says, no, if you look here, there's this Hubbard policy that says, People on the ship absolutely do not have sex. He wrote that because that was happening. Yes. Like if you want, like he didn't just write that for no reason. Think about it. If there never were people having sex on the ship, he never would have written that. Yeah, and that's why so, he never wrote about um, like asbestos because yeah. he didn't know anything about asbestos, so he didn't yeah. write about it. But he knew he got really itchy from that fiberglass. So yeah. in Scientology, fiberglass is like the worst thing you could possibly have in a room. Right. If there's asbestos, they'll paint right over that. That's not a big deal at all. But can't have fiberglass. No sir, bomb boo, because L. Ron yeah. Hubbard never wrote about asbestos. Yeah, I said major flap. That was definitely my my. <laughs> cold brain kicking in yes <laughs> okay yeah, major flap um have you can april in amsterdam says have you considered making a feature about the sptv phenomenon well i think that it would be an amazing documentary i don't know i haven't but i, I but i have i have pondered many times about this reckoning that's happening yeah There's, somebody it, should figure it all out and do it's it it's not just a reckoning it's not just a reckoning about you know former scientologists i hate the word x by the way yeah i, I think it's really negative former you like yeah, former yeah, i prefer former i think okay I, like okay. i refer to my former wife as but not my. you ex, know that's funny wife. because in all the videos that i do um for claire on her where is shelly miscavige series i always write former sea org member or yeah, former it's, scientologist it, it's a much smarter way to do it uh, yeah 
Yeah. I just didn't know that anybody cared, but I've always write former just because well, I think I care, it's kind of sounds better. I okay, care. well, now I know, and I'll keep it that way. You're if I to me. X okay. just doesn't look right to me. Yeah. That's all. We'll talk about that another time. I have a whole reason for that. But OSA but, Agent 28. No, just let me say that. It's, oh, sorry. It's not just us. Yeah. It's not just us. You know, this never in phenomena where the biggest, yeah. which is public opinion, it's the biggest. Uh, the biggest number of people that are watching all the in the SBTV nation are never ends. Yeah, and a lot of them are coming from other places where they were traumatized. Where, yes, where they're good people, and so there's. We are now at the center of a kind of a reckoning that is really wants to make the world a better place. And forgive me, I think I, so. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I I predicted at some point some very smart journalist who's not just some hack who works for you know one of the corporate media outlets is going to pick up on this and they're going to start writing about it they're going to start writing maybe about it. it's actually it's, it's definitely something it's it's not i don't even no, know that you could kind of identify or quantify it exactly but there's definitely something happening yeah. with this whole i think what we call sptv phenomena it's there's something weird that. happening yeah it's what we call jokingly but it's attracted so many people outside of Scientology. And I think it's it's emerging into something that I would definitely make a documentary about because it's yeah. Yeah. So the answer is no, but I will. Okay. <laughs> Osa Agent says the down vote was me. Much love, Tommy Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Davis. That's a very uh, well timed comment there. Yeah, I have um, I have stories about Tommy. We'll get Oh those. yes, we all have such good Tommy Davis stories. Cat and Maggie says nearly got Tommy Davis. Inquiry minds wanna know. Yeah, we'll we 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 might have to do um, when we go through all these films, we might have to do like a special projects, um, yeah. some special projects videos. Cause like Mitch said, every once in a while we'd get roped into a music video or the main unit would shoot an event video, which was sort of a big deal. And we did that in the nineties for the golden yeah. age of tech and right. some of these things that happened in Scientology. So we'll definitely have to cover that because it did happen. Tom, um, okay. Tom, Tommy was a rich, good looking, rich boy. Mm -hmm. who had very expensive clothes so i knew i could and i cast him in this one music video it's a crazy story and then also not long after you were gone when after jason became left tommy handed me a recorder and said you know dave wants you to call jason and talk him out of going on the matt lauer show oh and wow jason was my friend i didn't want to do that we'll tell that story nice it, it's a great story i mean i did speak <sighs> with him we do have so many stories christian b says mitch and mark have amazing stories can either of you think of a time you pulled one over on the tiny elf bossy boss man like said you reshoot and didn't like said you reshot and didn't mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't, I want to, I don't want to yeah. say we got anything over on him, but every, but, but even like I said, or I might've said this in another video, or I might've said it on another channel. Um, this whole 16 can 16 shots in a can thing. Um, Mitch knew it was kind of odd and it wasn't the best, um, yardstick or yeah, it, it wasn't, was psychotic it wasn't a creative way to count right. the statistics so it kind right. of it kind of hampered certain things but it also encouraged us once we were doing um something to figure out how many shots we could we always tried to do more coverage because we needed the shots and right. mitch right. and mitch kind of played along with that and and it we and usually it was a case where um we had we never had any dogs on the crew either which was a shitty thing um but um he wanted um sometimes if mitch said hey we could just throw another lens on and get an alternate in this at yeah. the same angle yeah because you had to, to qualify as another shot if i told the uh, the directors to do something different in the same script shot that's not a different shot but if you move the camera or change the lenses so yeah. if we were short on shots. I just say Mitch would be like, way. "Hey, let's throw the let's throw the 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 thirty five on this, or let's put let's yeah. put the twenty five on this, or the whatever it was." And he'd be like, yeah. "Oh, thank God, Mitch is playing the game today. Thank yeah. God, because so Mitch we, could be Mitch could, Mitch could be uh, he could either be in playing the game mode or he could be in the I need to get the hell out of here mode. And if he was in the get the hell out of here mode, even then sometimes he'd yeah, be like, no. shoot this and shoot that on the like if it, he didn't like if it was a." Um, 
like an ECU, like a, 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 a of a page or something. Mitch didn't need to be there for if we were shooting a, a, a policy letter. Yeah, B-roll or like B-second uh, unit shots. And so he would kind of tell us, do this, do this, do this, do this. I'm leaving. And then we, yeah. then he could leave early and then we'd get 10 shots out of an hour's worth of work. So for us, it'd be like, oh, yeah, Mitch is playing yeah, the game. Yeah, but, but they got wise to it after a while. And then yeah, say, it, we kind of. Like the yeah. city sec would say, you have a bunch of meter shots tomorrow. You don't have to be on the set. You need to go do your sec check. Or yeah. <laughs> whatever it was. So. And that's also another thing was if we were doing, um, if we blew something up, it counted as two. But if there was an E meter in the shot, that also counted it as a special effects shots right. because the way we made the E meter, the E, uh, the needle on the E meter read was with this special effects piece of equipment. It was basically yeah. just a digital audio recorder. It was, yeah. like, it yeah. was actually, it was a Mac um fx2 i think right and, and we, we had these little like drives we'd have these little drives that we'd put in there and then we could just play back the sound and we plugged the the headphone jack of the computer in to the um, e-meter and it would make the needle do the exact right, right. thing yeah but if, we get double points for those yeah. shots but if you remember mark eventually we had the reads recorder which was yes. a student device that had that students could use in the course room and you, you push a button and it would give you the read but now this is the tricky thing yeah about that is that the, it very specifically says on the reads recorder yes that <laughs> yes this that the reads recorder is not that should not replace a thorough study of e-meter reads specifically seeing the e-meter reads film yeah so which we, we use them the, which we use the reads recorder for <laughs> yeah so it was one of the biggest inside like yeah what a scam a total, total scam yeah just... no, no there's not one real thing happening in those films which is kind of funny because there's not really anything real happening in a lot of these scientology organizations yeah. it's it's kind of like david miscavige learned from the films that if you just made something look a certain way people would believe it and so yeah, yeah he that's why used... i gave my book the how, the how i made an evil cult look good yeah, it, it literally is how these events came to be yeah. such a, a juggernaut for David Miscavige yeah. is he could put on a show of what Scientology looks worldwide yeah. that yeah. wasn't what was happening, but yeah. he could make it look like it was. Yeah, the, his exact words were the, the things we did, they need to look so good that in and of themselves, just on technical artistic execution, they would command respect for Scientology. Yeah. That, that was the underpinning philosophy. And I was like, yes, sir, let's do that. I'm, yeah, really, well, I'm good at that. I can make anything look good. Right. Jenny says, what was your favorite thing to do that little Davey never found out about? Would you do, would you do a movie now? Uh, um, I think she means like, would you just do a movie? I think you'd have to have somebody who wants to do a movie with you. That's how directors get movies is somebody wants to make a movie and they want that guy to be their movie guy. So right. Right. Um, or or they just get enough money and make their own movie. Yeah, I don't know, Joni. We have to think about this one. This question and the last question are kind of we I, I'd have to think if we ever did anything. I mean, there's tons of things that happened that Dave never found out about, but yeah, like most the way, of them weren't that big of a deal in the, the way we would fake a lot of do a whole bunch of extra shots changing lenses and whatever just to make a quota and he could never complain about that because there's there was hubbard uh, stuff that said the director is allowed to get all that what they call cover shots he yeah wants, so yeah it was sort did. of it was sort of kind of baked in that we could get away with that because it all and also to be honest it's not a bad thing to have more coverage or more shots to be able to edit with it's 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 only bad when you have too little so yeah, yeah. it wasn't like we were erring on the wrong side of that yeah. uh, equation. We, we figured out a good gimmick. Okay, so we're not going to say some of these words in here, but I'm going to read this comment. Okay. Ali Alicia Friedman says, did you guys ever do films with Danny Masterson, who was just recently convicted of um, some assaults, um, and he is currently a Scientologist in good standing? If so, do you think Captain Davey will demand a redo or not because DM – Danny Masterson isn't a declared SP. The answer to that question is we 100% did shoot a film with Danny Masterson and it was in the early 1990s. And it's one of the next films that we have coming yeah, up because yeah. it was one of the films that was shot pretty early on. He was and Danny, 15, yeah, I was going to say Danny Masterson was like 15 or 16 when we did this. Yeah, and you know who else was in that fi film I just remembered was uh, uh, Marissa Rabisi, Bonnie's sister. Yes, she had yeah. red hair in that film. She I think. played the ragdoll. 
Yes. That was Raggedy my first Ann. that was my first girlfriend. Oh. Well you have you have I mean, as proven by your wife, you have good taste. <laughs> I I really uh enjoyed Marissa. It was very sad to see that she, she was a great she was a really cool twin she's funny yeah sister. she's vonnie rabisi's twin sister uh, vonnie i don't think we ever shot any no he was films always with telling vonnie me i'd run into him and see celebrity center all the time and we talk and he's like oh man i really want to come up and do a film with you but we could just never work it out because yeah he was really starting to take off yeah but yeah the film we did with danny we're not going to get into it now it was a really interesting experience. Yeah. Uh, it's coming up though. It is one of the first ones yeah. that it's the, I think it's one of also the films that you shot. Um, I was also in that film, but you shot that film before I was the crew chief and I became the crew chief very shortly after. Okay. That. Okay. Yeah. You were right. You were, you were as this, this, the Sea Org missionary hero of that film. I was, I was, you, I saved you, the day. You were the ethics guy, but to I answer, I saved the day and I saved Danny essentially. He was yeah, gonna, he was yeah. on the chopping block and I saved yeah. him. Yeah, but to answer the other part of that question about redoing it, um, absolutely it'll be redone. There's yeah. no doubt it will be redone. I kind of think they're not even gonna take it out of circulation until it is redone because that bubble like is so, like anybody who's so inside told you that they'd be on a course seeing the film. They yeah. don't, probably don't even know that any of this is happening. Well, they also probably don't even, a lot of people might not even know that that's Danny Masterson in the movie. He is dressed right. like a weird little doll in a space of yeah, Cap silvery, silvery LeMay kind yeah, of he, he onesie. Plays, <laughs> he plays a space doll just to tease the film in Scientology on these courses where you'd see these films. The the people learning to audit with e-meters, they practice on a doll, a big, big life, big doll, like, like the size of a ventriloquist dummy and your twin would hold the doll and would do the you know, would answer like on the doll like you'd say how are you doing today and you go oh i'm fine you know you'd you'd, you'd mimic like you were the doll so the premise of this film is actually kind of cute it's one of hubbard's cuter ideas at night these what they call academy dolls would come to life and they'd audit one another it was like night at the museums but with these yeah. weird, with these weird yeah. dolls yeah, and exactly, the, exactly. and danny masterson was a boozer doll he would literally well, sniff it, empty booze bottles well, when he got that, it. Happened, that <laughs> happened after he got in trouble but he got yes. in trouble because he was flirting with goldie dawn the other doll i know but you can't make this up he was in trouble because he was making unwanted advances at the other with doll another doll and then he when he was hiding out in the attic he found a bunch of empty booze bottles and he was addicted to sniffing them. And he got and, her to try to do it too. Yeah. It's, he it's got all it. there. And yeah, it's all had, in this film. This is, and I was joking about Mitch, I was joking with Mitch. I said, this might have given him a lot of ideas well, back not, in this we, day. Then, then we did the film with Jason Begay where he he, he uh, drugged and raped his best friend's partner. Oh, right? don't say the R word. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> anyway, yes, we. This does take place in a lot of at least I'm, I'm two still, films. I'm still learning. At least in two films, um, there are there is assaults that take place within the story context yes, yes, of yes. the film, and in which the person is redeemed through Scientology and there's no reason to call law enforcement yeah. or report the crime. Why in, would you? And in both instances, the assaulter uses drugs or alcohol to um, get that person in a yes. more malleable format. Yes. And Scientology auditors are being subtly programmed. Hmm. I didn't even think about that until we yeah. just, you mentioned the Jason one and I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually kind of a common theme. Yeah. Um, that's kind of weird actually. Yeah, if you it's think very about weird it. because basically what it's saying is the technology you are learning in Scientology has the power to restore a person that's so broken. Yeah. They commit a crime like that. And it has the power to restore and heal the victim. Yeah. But in reality, they protect the criminal and they traumatize the victim. So yes. Because they can't obtain this thing that Hubbard is promising. No. So they, that, the, it, it goes it goes very wrong. But anyway, that's all. There's a lot more to come where that came from. Okay, we got one last comment, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. It's John okay, Satowski good. says, "Did you ever get someone from the RPF because you needed them?" in a film no i wouldn't say that we did that because you weren't really even allowed to be in a film unless you yeah. were sort of like considered a staff member that's going to be around forever 
and yeah. that there's no kind of really chance that you would escape or that you would get get out of there, yeah. which is a reason why I could be in a film just at the drop of a hat. I could just, like if somebody didn't show up for a shoot or the actor that we were getting from Los Angeles, it was just like, hey, Mark, put on a put on the suit, put on a whatever, you're gonna go in there and you're gonna do this. And, um, and that's how I could be the guy that falsified the meter reads or right. you know, one of these guys, right. is, I could just change my outfit and go be in the shot, so. Right, right. Um, let me again i uh, want to just show um some of these banners real quick here okay, um check out mitch's channel don't forget to check out mitch's channel um at scientology the big lie on youtube um you can also go to his indiegogo project scientology the big lie and then there's also a link to his uh, buy me a coffee link in the description of this video if you're watching on my channel the blown for good channel please go over to mitch's channel and like and subscribe over there we're trying to get mitch up to uh 15 000. what are you what are you at right now on subscribers oh, well, i finally just broke 3k um we're trying to get uh, as many more subscribers yeah, I want to, to get mitch's to channel as, we can. as quickly as i can i gotta keep the lights on up <laughs> Yeah, we're trying to uh, make no this. More, so. We're trying to make this a real thing, not just. Uh, yeah, there's a you strike know. in Hollywood. You know, I left. I left my career in Scientology, and there's been a strike in Hollywood. And yeah, there's not a lot. There's not a lot of director work floating yeah. up uh, onto Mitch's plate these there's days. Not a lot of any work. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, it's great. Really appreciated. It. It's an amazing community. Uh, it's really nice to have actual friends that you can confide in and, and count on, which because you can't when you're in Scientology. That just doesn't exist. And also when you do kind of join into this kind of area, like if you were in Scientology for a while, now you're going to tell your story. It's a little, uh, it's a little weary to navigate on who's doing what and, you know, how you're going to be able to work with them. And it's, it, you know, the, yeah. almost all the people that are doing this are from completely different places and completely the different times and backgrounds. Right. And right. we're not all of us worked at Golden Era. Not all of us worked on the film. So for Mitch and I, this is the one, I mean, I've been doing this since 2005, but right. um, there's nobody that's really come out from Golden Era Productions that worked where I worked in this yeah. whole time. This yeah. is a very rare moment where somebody that was pretty much there he was absolutely there he was there before i got there and he was there after i got there so yeah. to have somebody that can verify i mean mike rinder and my wife and some of these other places they were the people they were there but they didn't work with me there claire never right. worked with me mike never worked right. with me we had interactions and in certain yeah. things but I worked with Mitch for yeah. many, many, many oh, no, years. We, we were, were with each other all day, yeah, we every in, weekday for yeah. years. Yeah, we were in the trenches, like literally. We yeah. were literally <laughs> taking bullets and like yes. handing each other ammo. Yes. Like all this crazy stuff. I did work with Mike, though, on a couple of projects, but yeah. Still, he's the over like on the life exhibition and the yeah exactly. Like, oh, I remember like, that too. God, that might be a oh, special one hey, too. Did you work on? Yeah, I just wanted. I worked on the system side of that. I didn't work on the film oh, side. Okay, oh, but you can speak to the this the Narconon film where we installed the system with the widescreen. Oh, you shot, were on that. I thought you were it was on shot that seven. Film. It was shot sideways on um like seven. Wasn't it? No, shot no, it was sixteen. It was actually super six. It was a super sixteen. It was a sixteen millimeter format, but it was sixteen millimeter horizontally. Yes, so that it had a wide frame. Yes, it, it was called Worcester Vision. It was, it was such a nightmare. We'll talk about that, but you didn't work on the Narconon film that we did. No, you didn't. The one you guys went to Shalaka, Oklahoma. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I know all about you, that one too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy, and there were there's all. I mean, that that's why we could literally go on. Um, forever, but we're going to tie this. We're going to tie a bow on this one. Um, if you guys want, um, you know, uh, there's we're going to we are going to cover some catchphrases. And yeah. before we get yeah. to those, I am going to make merch of them and we're going to put them in our merch store yeah. because there's some really funny ones. And I guarantee yeah. you when you hear us tell you them, you're going to say that should be on a mug yeah. or a T-shirt yeah. or something, of course. And so we're going to make that ahead of time because yeah, I, I really I, think they're strong. I um, you utterly, Mark. Yeah, you can go to Zenu is my uh, Zenu is my homeboy, and tons of other amazing BFG merch uh, can be gotten from the blown could, uh, blown for good store, and the link is in the description. And then also, if you want to get a copy of my book, you can get that in the merch store as well. Um, all copies that I send of my paperback or my hardback um, are signed by my wife and myself, 
And you can get those from blownforgood.com or you can get those from the merch store. And then lastly, um, you can support the Aftermath Foundation by going to the aftermathfoundation.org. Um, that is a foundation that helps people that are just recently getting out of Scientology and they need a little bit uh, of help getting, you know, like getting a place to live or getting a license or being able to, somebody has to teach them how to drive a car. Like people that just have zero resources in life, we try to give them a little helping hand to, um, to get on their feet, back on their feet. So thanks for that, guys. Thank you for everybody who yeah, tuned one, in. One last announcement. Yes. Tomorrow, two o'clock, I'm going to be making a major, breaking a major story. Oh, and awesome. Nobody's going to want to miss this. So two o'clock on uh, PDT Pacific Daylight Time on my channel. I'll okay. Have a, I'll have a special guest and I'll be releasing some news Ooh. that I just recently found out which because I still have these relatively recent, very high up connections. Cause yeah. remember I was working like through 2020 and anyway, so check that out. I'm okay. Tomorrow. That. Big news. What time? Yeah, uh, two o'clock. I, I, I'll drop it. I haven't scheduled it yet. I'll drop it right after the show. Make yeah. sure you guys go there and, um, and sign up to notify when that comes yeah, live. And then you'll gonna just wanna, get You're going to want to know about this, especially, exes and anybody that's really intensively uh watching Scientology you're going to want to know about this, this is wow a teaser yeah. guys look yeah. at this yeah big deal awesome guys well thank you Mitch for joining me today thank you thank Mark you. I can't thank wait you. for the next one we are these are going to be a, a load of fun guys and and we could literally um we could probably tell 10 stories each on every single one of these and never run out of insane things that happen because it was very there was not a lot of routine days when we were shooting no, usually no, something not. would happen that you'd be like i'm probably going to remember that for a while well yeah. you know do you remember mark um i know we're trying to wrap this up but you yeah one of the cine the cine eds the devices from hubbard said each and this became a, a, a posted on the wall and whatever each film memorable in its own right well I yes tell you, each <laughs> shoot that we did was memorable in its own right. yes like without a doubt. it was it was yeah. and the films were actually pretty memorable for for yeah, the most part they were. And, and mostly <laughs> if you turn the sound off they all look great I, i'm just gonna, yeah. I own some of the writing and the dialogue blah 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 but so the, these are really good looking films yes hopefully we'll be able to get them leaked okay i'm done we need to we, we, we need to bring this to a controlled landing thanks for joining us guys we'll see you next time on uh, mark and mitch make a scientology film number three